Hey there, welcome into Unpaid Interns. It is December 21st, Monday afternoon here in Indiana. I'm Griffin Epstein. Appreciate you tuning in as we approach the holidays. And we have a really special treat for you today. One of my mentors, someone I, I listened to growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, the radio play, play, play voice of the Oakland Athletics, Ken Korak, joins us today. Ken, it's really a treat having you on. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Griffin. And you mentioned December 21st. I think a lot of us are thinking, can we just fast forward to January 1st and we can get uh, 2020 over with pretty quickly? <laughs> well, that that's for certain. It's been a tough year and a very unique year in so many ways. And that includes baseball for you. Obviously, a, a very unique season, 60 games shortened season, no fans, uh, the road games, it, no, no, you were you weren't able to go to as a, as a broadcaster. What was the whole experience like this year of broadcasting with the A's, who also had a very great season this year? They did. It was, as you know, it was very unique, Griffin. And and I entered the whole thing with a certain level of trepidation. I mean, even the question of whether or not we should be doing it or broadcasting the games, and you get down to the the aspect of testing because we were testing and. Initially, I questioned that thinking, you know, if people in the community can't get tested and we're getting tested all the time and there's it, it kind of became a almost a moral question for me. But, um, you know, as it turned out, I think from a broadcasting standpoint, and we can talk about this a little bit, bit later, but I think people got something positive out of the fact we were doing the games. That was the main thing. I mean, I, I think for me that and I think we, we do this anyway, but. Um, broadcasting the game for the fans because so many people and, and, and even now continues to this day, sheltering in place, unable to get outside. Uh, baseball was the first of the major sports to come back in play. So hopefully we provided a sense of joy and maybe a diversion and some entertainment for people who were really longing for that. And the fact that we had baseball, even though it was a, a truncated season, um, it happened quickly, 60 games in 66 days, that I think it was worthwhile to do it. And then, you know, to go back to the, the um, you know, the subject I mentioned earlier, which was testing. We were tested before each homestand. But it also allowed, because even though there weren't fans in the stands, there were, you know, 200, 250 people that were working each uh, game from, you know, security guards and people working in the ballpark and, uh you know, the various things that have to happen for a game to take place. And I think it allowed those people to feel comfortable going back to work. So people in the community had jobs. Maybe it sounds like a small thing, but um, I think that was a positive aspect uh, to come out of the whole thing. Obviously, it was also different just in terms of pure broadcasting, no fans. I mentioned, you know, not being able to go on the road with the teams. What specifically changes did you make to, to maybe your play-by-play -play or your setup and your routine with, the, with so many unique things going on? Well, the home games were pretty much the same with the exception of the fact there weren't any fans there. So, you know, that was a big difference. Um, in terms of the way kind of the logistical aspect of it, um, the biggest change was, of course, while the team was on the road because we weren't traveling. So once the team left, we did those games off the TV monitors, which isn't ideal, but it's what we had to work with. And I had no problem with the fact that we weren't traveling. I think it was the right thing to do. So for the home games, we were calling the games as we normally would. And I think I kind of you know, I didn't know how it was going to feel because they were piping crowd noise into the ballpark. And I think it turned out to be a good thing, actually, uh, because I know for me personally, it gave a little boost of energy. I mean, it would have been even rougher, I think, if there had been no sound at all. So and I listened to quite a few broadcasts from uh, the other ball clubs, Griffin. And I think on radio, it, it kind of almost sounded normal. I mean, it was it was fake crowd noise, but it sounded real, if that makes any sense. <laughs> now, and and the way that we had things set up, because nobody was traveling, so none of the visiting teams were there, of course. Um, I worked in the visiting TV booth. So I had the whole visiting, which is this huge, you know, I had great, you know, I mean, nothing good has come out of this pandemic, but um, I did have a chance to spread out and had a lot of privacy in there. I had a sense of security doing it that way. 
So I was in the visiting TV booth and my radio partner, Vince Catronio, was in the home radio booth to my right. And when we had Ray Fossey with us, because, uh, you know, Ray does the bulk of the games on TV, but if the game isn't on local TV or if Dallas Braden was on television, Ray did radio with us. And he was down in a press box area to my left. So we were in separate areas. But the mechanics of it, I think, worked out fine. I, I didn't feel that we lost anything in terms of the chemistry. Now, when the, when the team uh, was on the road, that was unique because we were watching TV like you would be watching at home. And it was fine once I came to the realization that we were going to miss some stuff. So naturally, you're not going to – the way I – the way I kind of characterized it, Griffin, was when you're doing the game live, you're calling what you're seeing. When you're doing the game off a of TV, you're calling what you're shown. So that's a pretty big difference, I think. Yeah, it's certainly a challenge for certain. And it was also a great season for the A's, one of their best in recent memory. They, they won a playoff series over the White Sox, their first time winning a, a series in the playoffs since 2006 and had a great regular season as well. I guess what was that like with, with one of the better teams we've seen in Oakland uh, in, in quite some time contrasted with with not having fans in just such the unique environment in, in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, great question, because there's nothing like the postseason energy. And this was the 11th time that the A's were in the postseason uh, since I've been doing the game. So I've been really fortunate to be part of some pretty historic moments, some that A's fans don't like to talk about, like the Jeter flip in 2001. But so you you really miss that. Uh, I, the series against the White Sox was important for the A's because, you know, they had won only one postseason series since their their run, you know, which included winning the World Series against the Giants in 89. So they needed to win a series. And even though it was best of three, that third game against the White Sox was a really dramatic game. Mm -hmm. And so it was a thrilling finish to that game. And then, of course, they go to the, what was then the the equivalent of um, the division series, and they play the Astros in that, but they have to play at Dodger Stadium. So, and I think that was a, a hindrance for the A's because even though they won the division, they really didn't have any advantage in going down there to play. And the Astros, even though they had a their numbers were really pedestrian during the regular season, um, they were on fire during that postseason series. And they beat the A's. I mean, it was fair and square. They were the better team in that series. Wanted to talk a little bit about your career. I know I know you started all the way back in Petaluma in, in my hometown at, at KTOB and, and have worked your way up and, and have now uh, uh, been with the A's uh, for for what, what I, I don't know the exact year number for basically the, the whole time I've listened to the A's on the radio. Longer than you've been alive. Yes, longer than I've been alive. <laughs> Um, but what what was I guess what was that like working your way up and and what's kind of um, your advice to broadcasters and, and journalists for for starting small at a you know a, in a, a small town like Petaluma and, and eventually getting to a major league ball club? Well, Petaluma is really close to my heart, as you know, Griffin. And in the fall of 1980, literally just over 40 years ago, is when I got my start in broadcasting. So I'm dating myself a little bit in mentioning that, but. Um, I don't, I don't dwell on, on numbers a whole lot, but this upcoming year will be my 30th year in the big league. So, you know, I'm pretty proud of that 26 years with the A's. So I guess you've, you have to do a couple things decently to have that kind of longevity. But so I've been, I've been really fortunate and I've had some wonderful people who have been supportive along the way. You can't, you can't do this on your own. So I, I owe a huge debt to, you know, a great number of people and, I think that the advice would be, and you and I have talked about this too, just to work as hard as you can. I mean, when I started, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I said that, that no one was going to outwork me and that I was going to be as professional as I could possibly be on the air and, and off the air. And then if I had some opportunities, you know, try to make some good decisions along the way. And I think it starts with the fundamentals in, in terms of doing play-by-play. -play. And it also, it's all rooted um, in a foundation of having, trying to establish credibility. Uh, you know, before you can, you can talk about 
you know, all of your opinions and tell me everything that you think is important. You better have credibility. You better establish that you can do the play-by-play. -play. You can the, the the rudiments of of play-by-play -play are something that you've mastered. So, um, you know, that's kind of a synopsis of the way that I've I've tried to approach it over the years. Now, in, in a normal season, you'd be calling 162 games, and and I know I've talked to you a little bit about your routine in prep into that. But I, I think for many of our viewers, they don't they don't get to hear from a major league broadcaster and from you know, that amount of games where you have very few off days uh, in a normal year, you're traveling across the country with the team. What is that whole routine like? And what's kind of a daily routine for, for 162 days a year of how you're prepping, getting to the stadium and so on? Well, Griffin, routine, I think, is the key word in that. Because when I started and back when I was living in, in Petaluma, uh, my first full season in the minor leagues was 1984 when the angels had a club in the California league, which in up in Roner park, which was, you know, less than a half hour North of, uh, of Petaluma up the one one freeway. And they played like 144 games in 148 or nine days. And that it was really a difficult adjustment because it's unrelenting. You know, you've got to do this and you've got to be on top of your game, um, every day for that, that long a stretch. So, um, Routine has been really important to me. Uh, and so, you know, maybe I'm, I'm too grounded in it. But I guess in a normal day, like let's say the team is on the road. Uh, normally, I would spend about an hour and a half um, in the hotel room getting ready, doing my homework. And then, you know, have a little time to myself, a uh, chance to explore maybe one of the cities we're in, have a little lunch, maybe work out a little bit. And then head to the ballpark and, and do the things that you do at the ballpark, as you know, because that's a, you know, that's a huge part of what we do. And the information you get around the batting cage or in the press room talking to the scouts. And no matter how much information you might gather on your own or the statistics you might find and research, you know, some of the, the best stories come from the interactions with the players and the coaches and scouts. So. Uh, and we didn't have that this year. I mean, that was one of the things we really missed because, and again, this was, it was set up the way I think it, it should have been set up, but we had no interaction with the players or even uh, the manager and the coaches, unless it was done from Zoom. So that was a little bit of a handicap, but again, that was just the nature of things this year. Mm -hmm. Now, one other part of your career I had to have to ask you about, uh, obviously many of our viewers associated with Indiana or Hoosier fans. I know you mentioned to me you, you've spent a, a little time in Bloomington, called some games at Assembly Hall. Uh, what's just your, your experience and, and, I guess, impressions of uh, IU Athletics in Bloomington? I never actually did a game there. Oh, okay. I did, didn't do a game there. I did do, um, I think it was 22 years of college basketball, and I would have loved to have done a game at IU but never did. Um, so I did 12 years of play-by-play of -play for basketball for UNLV. And they had a, a pretty historic Final Four game against Indiana back in the 80s. Mm. But the, you know, I've always had great respect for the program. And obviously, uh, Bob Knight was a larger-than-life figure. So if I think back over the time that um, Griffin, that I've had the, the chance to do college basketball, I did a, games in a lot of historic places where, you know, I love the, I love walking into the old arenas and field houses because of the, I mean, they, they just ooze history. Like um, Allen Fieldhouse at Kansas was really a great place to go. Did a couple of games there, <clears throat> but never did a game at, at IU. I'm curious. I, I didn't even, I didn't even think of that 1987 game. Indiana would go on to, to win the national championship uh, in, in that next game after beating UNLV. Do you, do you have any specific memories from that game? Cause I bet many of our older viewers uh, can remember watching that. Well, I didn't start doing the rebels until 92. So in 87, I was doing San Jose States games. Okay. And parenthetically, they had a great football win on Saturday to win the Mountain yeah. West championship over Boise state. But Freddie Banks, who is a Las Vegas native, if I recall, scored, had like 36 or something in that game. I mean, he had a huge game. And so that's my my biggest memory. But it was a, I mean, it was a really good ball game. And when I was doing the Rebel games, I 
my analyst, our analyst was a guy named Glenn Gondrizik, the late Glenn Gondrizik, who was a wonderful guy, passed away, you know, way too prematurely. And, and he played in the Final Four in 77. Uh, and UNLV had another really great game that came right down to the wire and eventually lost that to North Carolina in the Final Four. One other aspect that was unique this year, going back to the A's, is that for the first time, the, the radio broadcasts were not actually on a radio station. It was the the, the well, it's can, the first. Can I correct you? Because at the last at the last minute, we did get a radio station. Oh, okay. So we did. But go ahead. I mean, the premise of your question, I think, is still valid. Right. Well, it was it was for. For the first time, you could access uh, the, the the A's broadcast essentially anywhere online for free. I, I was able to listen to some of the games through TuneIn uh, here in Indiana. I, I guess what was the feedback you, you heard from fans uh, about that? And people are saying maybe maybe that's the route going forward more often is through Internet radio. Is that something you maybe see becoming more commonplace uh, for teams using radio? You know, it's a great question. And... For a long time there, it looked like we were that the only carrier of A's baseball and radio was going to be uh, through the internet. And like I said, it was like an 11th hour deal to get on a local radio station in the Bay Area. And I do think that's a direction you're going to see teams go. So there was a point there where it looked like that was the way we were going to do the games. And I was thinking that we would not be in five or six years down the road that we wouldn't be the only team doing that. Now, the fact we were able to get on an AM radio station, I think, was significant this year, Griffin, I think especially because of, like I said, with with people, you know, unable to get out and folks could not go to ball games, and especially older people um, who obviously are a lot more vulnerable to the virus and, and just being at home day after day after day, and maybe who weren't, uh, hugely tech savvy, the chance they could tune into an AM radio, uh, I think it made a difference. So I, I think it had a positive impact. And I go back to your, your first question um, about doing the game. So I think that was one aspect that was really valuable for us. And I think hopefully we made an impact uh, both through the streaming and also through being on AM. But the fact that we have this A's cast streaming service, which is on, you know, it's 24 hours a day. I mean, if you live in the Bay Area, you can tune in to the to A's cast at three o'clock in the morning and get A's programming. And so I think it is a really neat thing because we've we've struggled over the years, I think, to really uh, find a station, whether it would be AM or FM, that was really devoted to a lot of A's coverage. And so if you're an ardent fan of the team, um, you know, it's it's there for you, you know, every day, 24 hours a day. Now we mentioned the A's had a had a, a really good season and, and won a postseason series, and they they've had a lot of success, especially in the regular season, really over the last ten to fifteen years. And and obviously, a lot of people know about about the Moneyball days, and that's been popularized by both the book and the Brad Pitt movie. Uh, but the A's continue to have success and not not paying players a lot in a small market, uh, not with a huge amount of national exposure. You've been around the, around the organization for such a long time. What's what's the key really to the A's maintaining this impressive success and what's been a very challenging AL West division over the past minute? I'm still getting royalties from Moneyball, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always fun to talk about that a little bit. We got a check a couple of weeks ago for like $12.27. Wow. So, you know, we can go out to lunch or do something, buy a couple <laughs> of sandwiches. But and, and Moneyball was seminal. I think the book and the movie helped change the game because if you look at the way, at the composition, Griffin of front offices right now in baseball, I think Moneyball has had a, a huge impact that uh, the way the game is is uh, played today and the way players are evaluated and, and just the, um, it's opened the door, I think, for other people to work in front offices that ordinarily maybe wouldn't be working in baseball. So, but the, the biggest thing for me has been that they've provided a, a ton of thrills. Uh, you know, over the course of my time with the A's, you know, how many broadcasters, and it's it's serendipity, we have nothing to do with it, you know, we just happen to be there. But a 20-game winning streak and, and three no-hitters, including a perfect game, and 11 times in the postseason, so... so 
we've had our share of thrills and even with the A's and the restrictions that they've had to deal with in terms of the payroll, uh, they've never thrown in the towel. So I think they've always made this great effort to be competitive. And I think Billy Bean and, and David Forrest and uh, the rest of the front office deserve a great deal of credit for that. And obviously the players and, and the managers and, you know, Bob Melvin right now, the, the skipper has been there for a long and you could not have from a broadcasting standpoint, a, a better manager uh, to work with. He's just been a dream from that standpoint too. Now there's been, there's been a lot of changes and discussion about changes in baseball, especially just over the last few years. Obviously just last year, we saw the, the DH implemented the national league. We, we saw the 10th inning rule where the runner starts on second base. Actually, I think the, the A's angels game to open the season was the first MLB game ever uh, for that to be implemented. Uh, I guess what, what's your view on these changes? You're right. Yeah. Do you, do you think they're here to stay and should they be here to stay? That's another great question. I, I really, you know, I guess you can overdo being a traditionalist and people have been around a lot like me. We always say, well, we believe in, in the traditions and we're resistant to when the game is altered. I really didn't like the idea at all of starting the, the 10th inning with the runner at second base because I thought it might lead to like a fluky outcome that you'd have a somebody winning the game on something that just that maybe wasn't deserving of because you battle for nine innings and and that, i was concerned about that i came to to accept it i'm not sure i i wholeheartedly endorse it but it was okay i think it was okay especially for this year <clears throat> and i don't there weren't any fluky outcomes and the a's had several extra inning games you know in two or three that went longer than 10 innings and i don't think there were any fluky outcomes so i i think that's that the whether it was the a's or the team they were playing the team that that won the game when you get you went to the 10th inning was deserving they deserved to win the game so that that was a good outcome uh, i'm a proponent of the dh being in both leagues uh, i don't think it's right that one team plays with a set of rules and then another the other league plays in a, in a different set of rules i do think one of the things to look at Griffin as we go forward is whether or not baseball will legislate where you play defensively, because with every year that goes by, there seems to be more and more um, resistance to all the shifting. And I don't think it's out of the question to think, I don't think it's going to happen this year that you're going to have set positions where the shortstop, let's say can't play to the right of second base. Or maybe you can shift, but you have to stay on the infield dirt the whole time. And so I think that's going to be, that'll be kind of a, you know, that'll be a big deal. That'll be almost a monumental change when that happens. And it wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if you, if you saw something like that uh, take place in the next couple of years. Yeah, that would certainly uh, be a really interesting change in a, another part of baseball that we've, we've seen with all the shifts, uh, especially popularized by Joe Madden and the Rays first that have changed yeah. the game uh, again. I, I guess kind of piggyback. Left-hander hitters that. would really be in favor of those changes. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Piggybacking a little bit off that, I think the other discussion we've heard about baseball, especially over the last couple of years, is it's not as popular among young people. Uh, it's not maybe not as engaging and, and trying to make it more fun and more diverse. Um I, I, what's your view on that? How can baseball, as someone that's been around the game for a really long time, market itself better, especially to the younger and more diverse generation? Well, the diversity issue is one that I think is really important. And obviously, um, it may be just tangential to the conversation we're having, but obviously the Black Lives Matter and the protests um, during the season, we saw quite a bit of that, and I think uh, for good reason during the year. But I do think that we need to get more action back in the game that the three true outcomes, you know, the strikeout, the walk and the home run. Um, I think that's kind of become too prevalent. And so maybe if, and I was really resistant to this, there was no way I even a year ago, I would have thought that I would be in favor of this. Um, <laughs> but maybe doing some changes with um, the shifting, you might put the ball in play more. I, I think that's a good thing. I've always been a proponent of umpires calling more strikes. I think if an umpire gets in there and calls more strikes, 
the hitters will make an adjustment, the pitchers will, and I, I think you'll see more action uh, because of that. There are certain things in the game where the ship's already sailed. I think that there's, and you kind of understand why, but the, the way the new ballparks are being built, there's not enough foul territory for me. Pitcher makes a good pitch and the ball goes into the stands. That's one reason why you on a foul ball. It's one reason why you have these really long at bats. And I think that's been a little detrimental. So, um, and, and then whatever you can do to try to, to, for the players to be accessible, I think is something that the NBA does extremely well. Yeah. And so whatever initiatives at baseball and it can be a slippery slope because, you know, miking players during the playoffs, I don't think was a good idea at all. Like guys are going after balls, trying to catch, like it happened to us with Mark Hanna and Ramon Lariano. You're trying to talk to the announcers while you're trying to field a fly ball. So I don't think that was a great idea, but making the players more accessible and getting, that's, I think it's one of the things that we try to do on the air too, is Dick Enberg, who was one of my idols in his autobiography, wrote about give the viewer or give the listener a reason to care. So, and that was kind of a cornerstone philosophy for him. And it shaped a lot of his preparation, the homework that he did. So give the people a reason to care. And part of that, I think, is getting to know the players beyond just uh, the numbers on their backs or the stats that they take with them to the plate. Hmm. Uh, that's definitely a, a good thought. Uh, you, you had a little advice earlier and many of the people watching, young journalists, broadcasters, play-by-play -play broadcasters uh, at IU, and especially right now, it's it's a big challenge. It's, it's tough right now for a lot of people in the sports industry, minor league baseball. We've we've seen some a lot of layoffs recently and some teams being cut. Uh, what's your just advice specifically for people maybe trying to make content and struggling with, with some of these changes right now in the sports media industry? Well, it's disappointing, right? Wouldn't you agree that they're Absolutely. shaving about 40 minor league teams off? Yeah, certainly. It's a tough deal. I mean, it really is because I know you've worked. Um, you worked in a wood bat league, didn't you? Yes. Uh, yes. Summer league. Collegiate league. Yep. Yeah, collegiate league. And so, you know, like I said earlier, I got my start working in single A ball. And so I, I just hate to see that because now you're, you're, you're peeling away the opportunities for people to get started in the game and not just broadcasters, but in all aspects of it, people that want to get into a front office or people that are, you know, getting into sales and whatever. I mean, I understand kind of one of the reasons they're, you know, part of the reasons they're doing it. So hopefully, um, you know, you'll see uh, independent, maybe a proliferation of, you know, the independent ball, there'll be more teams there. So I just hate to see opportunities go away. But I, I do believe this, that if you work hard, you do a good job, you present yourself well, and you're a professional, that there still will be opportunities. And there are actually more opportunities now than there were when I was coming up because of cable TV. I mean, you have, you have things like with you guys, with the Big Ten, uh, don't you have opportunities for the student broadcasters that do games on TV? Absolutely, yes. We never had that when I was a kid. And you, when I was a kid, we didn't have cable TV. So, you know, I really think that there, um, there are more opportunities now than there were. So work hard. Uh, be a pro. Try to talk to as many people as you can. Uh, do your homework. Uh, work on your craft. Work on the fundamentals, especially when it comes to play-by-play. -play. And then I really believe that, that good things will happen. And the other thing is, is that, I never try to limit myself to just one sport. I was equally as invested in baseball as I was in basketball and football. And because of that, I think if you can create as more avenues for yourself, and I did, I played records when I was younger on KTOB, I did a talk show. So give yourself more opportunities. And the more you do, you're just gonna get better. Even if it's not something that is the, like the perfect job at that time, just being on the air, uh, you're going to get better. Uh, the more reps you get like a player, the more reps you get, you're going to get better. You just gave a lot of advice there for, for people in sports media and play by play. And I guess the last question on this advice kind of for you, you've seen a lot of play by play people. You've listened to a lot, worked with a lot. What, what specifically makes a good play by play announcer in your mind? And what can people do to get to that level? 
Wow, and you're getting pretty deep there, you know. Well, first of all, let's let's begin with this. It's a very subjective business. Like, you know, to quote Paul Simon, one man's ceiling is another man's floor. So I don't know that there is a formula or a prescription because even some of the, the greatest broadcasters of all time, they're going to have their detractors. And But I think that what you can control, not to be repetitive, but you can control how hard you work. You can control how humble you are and how professional you are and how you get along with people. And you can control mastering the fundamentals. Those are the most important things. And you can control how hard you work. I think beyond that, you know, I think having a, you don't have to sound like James Earl Jones, but having a voice that is a pleasant voice and you can work on that. There are a lot of things you can do to try to work on your presentation because I think no matter how much information you have, Griffin, you have to be comfortable to listen to, and especially during a baseball season. You, you better wear well over the course of time because you're on the air almost every day for six months. And so, you know, I think having credibility is really important. When I interviewed Vin Scully back in 1997 at the, the advent of interleague play, the first series the A's played against the Dodgers during the regular season, I said, what's the essence of a baseball broadcast? And he said, it starts with credibility. So, and you have to build from that. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Capturing the moment, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things that, that go into it, but uh, I kind of come back to, you know, you you have to you have to wear well over time. You have to be credible, and you have to be able to call the game. You know, like you know, with with baseball or even in basketball too. You, you just you have you want to be the eye. Now I'm I'm someone that comes from a radio background primarily. Although I've done a lot of TV, but you really want to be the eyes and the ears of the audience. So picture somebody listening. And then you're describing what you see. I mean, that, that kind of boils it down to its essence that you're describing what you see for someone on the radio. Hmm. Definitely. A great, great advice across the board. I think people are listening will really appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that, man. It's, uh, you know, and it, then, then I, I think that listening to people that you really respect, not to copy because they're, they're, you know, plenty of copycats out there. You have to find your own voice. Hmm. And that it took me a really long time to kind of come to that realization. Um, I tied myself up in knots. I was neurotic at one time because I got to a big market really early in my career. <laughs> and I felt like from a talent standpoint, I was ready for it. Emotionally and psychologically, I wasn't because I kept thinking, how am I ever going to be as good as these people that are like working in like the fourth largest market in the country? And I kind of came around eventually to the feeling that you have to find your own voice and you have to you have to be yourself. Well, great advice and, and really enjoyed a, a lot of the advice and, and career anecdotes that you've given. And, and was just for a final question for you, curious if you could share maybe a story or a memory over, over your time with the A's or in broadcasting uh, that stands out and, and, uh, and the viewers would, would enjoy listening to. Well, th I, I think it kind of starts with Bill King for me. And I was lucky enough to have a publisher who was willing to work with me on a project to write a book about Bill. And eventually Bill received the Ford C. Frick Award uh, from Baseball's Hall of Fame, although it was posthumous, which was you know the only bittersweet aspect of it. But when you get a chance to work with one of your idols, because as a kid, I listened to Bill every night when he was broadcasting for the Warriors. And then, of course, the Raiders and then the A's in 1981. And he was such a unique and diverse and multifaceted person, Griffin, as you know, being from the Bay Area. And then you get a chance to work with that person for 10 years. I mean, it was a thrill a minute working with him. And so I think that, I mean, I've had so many. I mean, Dallas Braden's perfect game. And I know people want to talk about that. My, the, the first NC2A tournament basketball game I got to do. Uh, lucky enough to do some bowl games. But I think the, the thing that stands out uh, for me, besides the incredible support I've gotten from fans of the A's and the A's front office, uh, you know, over all these years I've worked for the A's, they've let me be myself and I've had the freedom to, 
do the games the way that I think they should be done, for better or for worse. There's been no interference. And then I've had just incredible support from the fans. But to spend those 10 years with Bill and to sit by him every day for 162 games, uh, I think it's something that was you know, pretty unique and, and really special for me in my career. Well, Ken, we really appreciate you coming on today. I mean, it was a really just a treat to, to talk to you and, and hear your advice and your stories uh, and your experience, especially in what's been a, a unique year for baseball and everyone. I uh, really appreciate you coming on today. Anytime, Griffin. I enjoyed it. Good luck to you and good luck to everybody at IU. Good uh, football team this year, man. Really good. It has been a very exciting football season. Everyone's very excited here in Bloomington. And the bowl, bowl game coming up in a few weeks in Florida. So. Yeah, that'll be Florida. fun. Enjoy that. All right, man. Thanks. Well, that will do it today for our episode of Unpaid Interns. Thanks so much again to Ken Korak for coming on. Hope you enjoyed it. We will be back again on Wednesday with another episode of Unpaid Interns. If you missed any of our past episodes, you can always check them out on the IU Sports Media YouTube page. Or if you prefer to listen, you can listen to them wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, take care, and we'll talk to you again on Wednesday.